All right. We'll start with the review of the common filter equations, which I have written down on the board on this, on this slide over here. We talked about common filter is a, a special type of observer with an observer gain given by some equation over here, which is related to the disturbance uh, spectrum, not spectrum, stochastic properties of the disturbance. And then we talked about last time how to implement this common filter law is to solve this Riccati equation to obtain this matrix M over here. Last time we talked about uh, we talked about how this Riccati equation is going to converge under the controllability and the observability condition. And then over there we compared this is the central message I want to talk about. Over there we compared the situation of the stability result. We mentioned that the common filter equation is going to be stable even if the system itself is unstable. And I want you to be able to derive this result here. For example, if I want to derive the uh, common filter closed loop dynamic By this, I mean I want to be able to express, uh, I will start with this case. I want to express this x hat k plus one given k to be some expressions k given k minus one plus uh, then some term here y k then plus some term here, uk. The explaining of this equation is like this. What do you think a standard observer looks like? A standard observer, is, a, is it a single input, single output system or not? Can you if you want to design an observer for a system, The observer is going to give you estimation of the state. What, what are the input for the observer? So an observer is not a single input, single output system. It's at least double input, single output. Actually, it's not even single output because the state sometimes is a vector. So an observer is usually a multiple input, sing multiple output system. So over here, this is why I written the equation this way. So the input for the, for the common filter dynamic are the signals u and y. And then the dynamics is trying to estimate the state, so it's x hat. I want to be able to derive from these equations here, these four equations here, to this equation. That's what I mean by common filter dynamics. So detailing the mathematics looks like this. I have x hat k plus one given k equal to, I'm gonna use this statement here, a x hat k given k plus b u k. And then I'm gonna substitute this common filter state dynamics over here to get a x hat k given k minus one. So here I'm connecting the two state estimations at uh, different time steps. Plus F, this case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna omit the index here for the F matrix. Then I'm gonna get YK minus C X hat K given K minus one plus B U K. BUK. The reason why I omitted the index for the observer gain is that we have known that in the steady state, the observer gain is going to converge to a constant. So I'm actually doing the steady state, assuming steady state. Yeah, linear time invariant sum. 
and then the retarding equation has uh, converged. So here, you see, the structure looks exactly like uh, like what I uh, what I wrote down in the last slide. So it's going to be some term which related to x hat k given k minus one. So it's going to be a identity minus f c x hat k k minus one plus a f y k plus b u k. Okay, so this is. You see something different here. It is not A matrix. It's not the sim simply the A matrix. It contains something else. This is intuitive to understand because uh, recall any observer design <coughs> or even LQ design, any kind of observer design, let's say, equals uh, AX hat K plus BU K plus L, I will use L in the standard observer. If you recall, 232 minus CX hat K. You see, recall in a, any kind of standard observer, the dynamic is going to be A minus LC X hat K plus something related to Y and then something related to U. You see, in any kind of standard observer, you have something similar. It's just in this case, the common filter case, it's another type of A matrix here. In a standard observer design, you have to make this, you have to make the eigenvalue of this matrix to be inside uh, the unit circle. Now, think about it. When we design common filter, we never mentioned how we, we never designed the common filter based on the dynamics of this matrix. We sort of just, uh, started from the uh, least square estimation and we derive this. Now the nice result is if, you, if we do that, this matrix guaranteed stable. Sta by stable, I mean the eigenvalues are inside the unit circle. So that's something nice and I want you to be able to understand that. So, Alternatively, this is one, one thing we can do. Alternatively, I'm going to start discussing an equivalent statement. The result is going to be equivalent. Alternatively, I can express this kind of dynamics into this form. X hat k given k plus something related to yk plus something related to uk. I can, I can also do this, and the, the steps how to achieve this is exactly the same as this step. The result is going to be I minus F C A. Then here, I don't care about this for the moment because I just want to show you that these matrices guaranteed eigenvalue inside the unit circle. Okay? That is... Uh, The derivations are here. So I have derived this uh, state dynamics, common filter dynamics, shown here. The first thing to notice when you see this is that these two matrices are different. And I have explained that the common filter dynamics it's going to be stable. So both of these matrices guaranteed eigenvalue inside the unit circle. Actually, if you dig into the details, the eigenvalues of A minus A, F, S, C is exactly, are exactly the same as eigenvalues of A minus F, S, C, A. There are multiple ways to understand this. So the simplified case, the special case, Special case is, uh, let's assume A is non-singular. If you want to prove, if you want to prove this eigenvalue statement, you gotta need to 
show that the determinant of, uh, let's say, the eigenvalues are lambda. Lambda i minus a minus a f s c equal to the determinant of uh, lambda i minus a minus f s c a. Right? So one intuitive way to understand this is that if I start with uh, lambda i minus, so look at the left hand side here, lambda i minus a, so the inside is identity minus fs c. If I multiply this equation with a on the right, if a is non-singular, all the matrices are square, so I can do this. Then I'm gonna get lambda a minus a i minus f s c a, which is equivalent to, now I can pull out the a matrix from the left hand side to get a lambda i minus i minus f s c a. Everyone follows this? Now take determinant on both sides. I'm gonna get determinant lambda i minus a so the inside of this is uh, a i minus f s c times determinant of a. So this side is exactly the left hand side of this equation here. And the right hand side, you got another determinant of a and then times determinant of lambda i minus i minus f s c a, which is exactly the right hand side of this equation here. So. We started with the special case that A is non-singular, so these two are gonna cancel. They are not zero, so. This is the one way to understand the result. The general case, general case, if A is not, is singular, A can be singular. In this case, the de determinant of A is zero. A singular means A has eigenvalues at zero. So this, this kind of analysis no longer holds. What we're gonna need to, what we're gonna need to do is to use another type of result. So I will mention this at the moment, but I won't prove it. Uh, it's a fact that the determinant of i plus m times n equals the determinant of i plus n times m, provided that the dimensions match, okay? But either way, I just want you to, to understand, this is our goal, and as long as you get this idea, it's fine. Any questions for this part? This slide is not not really that essential. The main idea is we have stated, I didn't prove this, I stated that this matrix, the eigenvalue of this matrix are inside the unit circle, but I didn't prove it if you think about what I did. So this is explaining why it's a, uh, the stability holds in this case. So it's very similar to the LQ analysis. You just have to understand the main ideas here. The detailed steps are a little bit more evolved. So the main idea is this. Remember, we have the Riccati equation, ARE. Look at this ARE. You see that some terms inside are very familiar. And I'm looking at, for this purpose, I'm looking at this term. I'm gonna use tilde here. What is this term here? I'm gonna recall on the blackboard.
This is the gain, right? The common filter gain. And on this side, you see something also very similar. C times MS. If I have something on the left times C times MS, I can have another FS transpose. The idea is we have explained the common filter closed loop dynamics is related to this matrix. So I wanted to show that the system defined by this closed loop matrix is stable. So I want to show, I want to have a one type of uh, Lyapunov analysis here, which is if I can do, essentially it's this one, essentially it's this one. So if I can somehow create this closed loop matrix A out of this Riccati equation, if I can somehow achieve this, then you see we have shown that w is this MS matrix positive definite? Two questions. Is this positive definite? Is uh, the right hand side at least positive semi definite? What about the, the first one here? When we say the common filter, the, the Riccati equation, when we say the two assumptions, controllability and observability, one of them is, con is gonna guarantee the Riccati equation is gonna converge to a constant. What does the other condition guarantee? So MS, the other condition is gonna guarantee MS is positive definite. And what about this side? This side is easier to see. First of all, it's symmetric, you see. If you, what about the, this term here? Is it positive, semi-definite, negative of this? Semi-definite. It may not be completely negative definite. For example, you see W is positive definite. So let's say W is one, one. As an example, let's say BW, I'm gonna let it be, let's say for a simple case, zero, one. Now look at this. It's gonna be, a B, is a B should be a column matrix, column vector. So it's B, B is, BW is this. Then I'm gonna have, zero one times one zero zero one and then on this side is zero one huh bw oh yeah look here oh yeah yeah i made a mistake bw in this case should be Scalar case, so let's say one. I, I made a mistake there. Good catch. So, yeah, is this matrix positive definite or positive semi-definite? Positive definite? This is actually a, a little bit tricky. Positive definite, positive semi-definite are sometimes very tricky. So positive definite means uh, for any matrix, I'm gonna say, Positive definite means if I multiply this, if multiply x transpose on the left hand side and x on the right hand side, the result has to be positive regardless of any x. Now, what if x is, uh, let's say, x is one zero. You see, the result is zero. As a, as a general fact, even if W is positive definite, if you have these things on left hand side and right hand side, it's gonna mess up the positive definite thing. So the matrix on the right hand side is not necessarily semi-definite, positive semi, negative semi-definite, not negative definite, but it's at least negative semi-definite, okay? Anyway, 
that's a little bit review of, of these results. But the main, main message is this. It's uh, exactly the same as the LQ problem. If I have A closed loop times M A closed loop transpose minus M equals negative Q, which is negative semi-definite. And this M is positive definite. You see, this is a Lyapunov equation. If I have these results, what does it say for the stability of the system? It's at least uh, stable in the sense of Lyapunov. Okay, so this is exactly the, the main message in this slide. It turns out, after doing some manip manipulations, we can translate this algebraic Riccati equation to this Lyapunov-like equation. Over there, you can see the common filter closed-loop matrix A, the equivalent closed-loop matrix A matrix in common filter. In steady state common filter is this guy. So the conclusion is that this, aim, this common filter dynamics is at least as stable in the sense of Lyapunov. That's the main message here. So after the additional analysis, it will be sh it's able to show that actually the system is strictly stable, asymptotically stable. Take it as much as you can. If you kind of feel lost over here, uh, it's fine. The main message is uh, common filter is good. It's stable. Now, starting from this slide, it's going to be a little bit evolve, involved. It's going to require some background knowledge of ME233. In ME233, when we discuss the LQ problem, I, I'm pretty sure you remember this symmetric root locus uh, analysis and the return difference equation over there. So in the common filter, it turns out the analysis is uh, quite similar. There's also a return difference equality in common filter, and there's also a symmetric root locus in common filter on this. We have the common filter dynamics over here, the first, but the first equation over here. If I do a Z transform, then on the left-hand side, it's going to be, it's going to relate it to Z X hat KK. Okay, then I can move this term on the left hand side here. And these terms doesn't change. You see, FSY, I minus FS DUK, and then this FS ZA X hat uh, KK. So this common filter equation can be equivalently represented by this block diagram. Actually, this is the reason why I have been keeping saying common filter, closed loop common filter, because this equation is, has some kind of closed loop dynamics, can be represented in this closed loop dynamics. Okay, so the how this guy comes from here, you see is exactly, let me start it with, uh, here. I have, okay, I can start here. I have the x hat k given k signal here. If I pass this signal to ca signal, this is the signal ca x hat k given k. Then I have on this side negative, negative fs times this signal here. And then to complete this block diagram, I'm going to see, I'm going to need this term to occur, fs times yk plus 1. Then another term, which is, uh, uh, let me put it here, which is i minus fs z times duk. 
cloud. <coughs> then here, you see, I have expressed this signal as the summation of these two plus the, uh, the summation of these three terms. So this signal, let me denote it as a, Q, okay. Q signal. Denote this as Q signal. Maybe QK. So you see, QK and X hat, K given K is related by X hat, K given K is equals ZI minus A inverse QK. So I have explained how to do. That's why this zi minus a inverse here. So you see exactly this is equivalent to this block diagram shown over here. So there is some type of closed loop dynamics inside the common filter. Now, as I mentioned, there is a return difference equality, return difference equality in common filter. First of all, I want to start by reviewing how does anyone know how this return difference, what does return difference mean? In this block diagram. So if you haven't seen this before, return difference is defined by this. If I, can I borrow a If I inject a signal identity here, if I inject a signal identity here, then I'm going to have passing through this path. The signal here is going to be F S Z I minus A inverse Z A. If I inject, if I inject a signal here, if I inject identity signal here. Passing through this pass, I'm going to get Fs Zi minus A, Ca. This is signal here. So this signal got returned. This is the return signal if I have a constant injection here. Return difference means the difference between the signal I injected and the signal that's returned. The signal that's returned, ke keep in mind there's a minus sign here. It's going to be minus CA, ZI minus A inverse FS, which equals this. So the return difference equality, if you see what does return difference mean, then it helps you to understand the return difference equality. It's expressing some kind of properties, this return difference has to satisfy. And the derivations are a little bit too much to do in the class. I suggest you to take a look at the ME232 reader if you want to know the details. But, yes. Or this? So uh, the student asks why this is injected. This is going back to the first equation here. Why, why this block diagram is equivalent to this? Let's go back a little bit here. I have on the left-hand side yk plus 1. So this guy is going to give me this term here. So I want to be able to express x hat k given k as the summation of these terms here, right? So this guy going to give me this, right? This guy is from here. Yeah, there's no, there's no, no additional term. Yeah, so after I added this one, these two are equivalent. Okay? If that is cleared, 
let me come back to this return difference equality equation here. I explained it's telling us how the return difference, this is the return difference, return difference. How the return difference, what kind of properties is satisfied? It turns out it's this. So this is from the algebraic Riccati equation. You can get this return difference equality. Uh, let me give some additional information here. So the way, if you recall the way I, we talked, we learned about this return difference. You see, return difference is something related to the, it's some closed loop. This is just the intuition. Closed loop explains the closed loop dynamic. It's a, it's a return, it's a difference between the injected signal and the return signal in this closed loop system. And on the right hand side, what do you see on the, on, on the right hand side here? G, G is the defined by GZ equals C A, is the open loop dynamic up here. C A Z I minus A inverse F F. G is defined by this. So what does the right hand side here intuitively looks like? So the right hand side, you see, it's telling us something about open loop. Mm. I, I will use the term transfer function. Everyone sees that? The right hand side is something related to the open loop transfer function here. The return difference, you see, <coughs> is telling us how the closed loop dynamic and the open loop transfer function are connected. Nothing else. So take this message, which will be the only term that we're going to be using for the following slide. And the detail, you see, it's kind of has symmetric structures here. This is because uh, the Riccati equation has some symmetric structure. But nothing, nothing else, nothing more fancy here. Let's do, uh, let's do one additional intuition here. If I have, if I have an open loop system closed by this negative feedback, <coughs> and this G, so I'm giving the intuition of this return difference equality in the simplified case of a single input, single output system. Let's say B, Z, A, Z. Here. So what do you think are the closed loop dynamics? What, what, what determines the closed loop poles in this case? Closed loop poles in this feedback loop. One plus G, Z, right? So the closed loop poles are determined by B, Z plus A, Z. This closed loop po uh, characteristic polynomial. So you see, it's exactly the case. The closed loop dynamics is it can be expressed as as something related to the open loop transfer function. You see, if I divide it by A Z here, I get one plus B Z divided by A Z, which is G Z. So this is the same intuition here. In the return difference equality, I have something about the closed loop dynamics. And on the right hand side, I have the transfer function. Nothing more. It's just uh, telling us the close to how the closed loop dynamics are related to the transfer function here.
Now, if I want to know the closed loop eigenvalue, what should I do from this return difference equality? Here is just a bunch of matrix multiplications. How will I be able to obtain the closed loop eigenvalues out of this? So take the determinant, I can obtain the closed loop eigenvalues, right? That's actually the same, if you recall 233, 232, that's exactly the same how we obtain the symmetric root locus by taking the determinant of the return difference equa equation. Yes, that's a very good question. That's exactly what I'm going to show now. So I'm going to show you that if you take the determinant on the left-hand side, the close of eigenvalue is just come, it's going to going to come right out of it. Okay. Here, if you take the determinant of this return difference, this is the return difference. Let's do the math together. Take the determinant here. Determinant of I plus C A. I'm going to denote th this big matrix as uh, temporarily as uh, M. Can you see? that this determinant equals M times CA. Can you see that? I have, I have stated this fact before, that determinant of I plus N times M equals determinant of I plus MN. All right? So now you see, take this as the matrix N here, then you see they are equal, all right? How many of you want to, want to see the proof of this? At least half, uh, if, if half of you guys wanted to see the proof, I would do the proof. Otherwise, uh, I will send a reference to you after class. So how, how many of you want to see the proof? see not enough so so I, I'll send you a reference how to prove this after class at the moment just uh, believe me it's the truth all right so now you see now you see why this is happening so the determinant of I plus CA times this you see if I shift I can change all this I can take I can put this on the left hand side of this to get this all right and over here Look at this guy. This equals determinant of, uh, I'm going to pull out zi minus a here, inverse here. And then inside I have zi minus a in order to create this identity. And then plus fs ca here. Now because it's a product between these two, it equals determinant of zi minus a inverse times the determinant of zi minus a plus fs ca. So, which is this, this case here. So, because determinant of the inverse matrix is equals one divided by the determinant of this matrix. Okay, this is the, the it, it, it will give us the open loop eigenvalues because it's, the it's, it's calculating the eigenvalues of the A matrix here. What about this guy here? It equals inside this ZI minus A minus FS ZA. Hmm. 
is giving us the eigenvalues of this matrix. And if you go several slides earlier, several slides earlier, this is the common filter closed loop A matrix. So immediately, you see the result. Immediately, you see, if I take the determinant on the left-hand side, I'm going to get If I take, you see here, take the determinant on the left-hand side, I'm going to get, for the first term, I'm going to get beta g divided by phi of g. And then inside here is the determinant of v plus phi ms phi transpose. Over here, this is the, be, be a little bit more careful about this term here. What will this, take the determinant of this guy, what result will come out in the form of phi, phi and beta? Be careful. It's z here, but it's z minus 1 here. Which term here? Yeah, so be, be careful about, about this here. If you take the determinant, it's going to give you this. And then on the right-hand side, is determinant of uh, V plus GG W G C inverse transpose. So I can shift terms. I can put these terms, the denominator, to the right-hand side, and I can divide both sides by this determinant to achieve this result here, okay? Let's do the special case here, which is related to symmetric root local. What if G, let's see, what if GZ looks like wide transfer function matrix? Then this term, it's going to become a scalar. This is a white matrix. The transpose is going to be a skinny matrix. So this is going to become a scalar. The determinant of a scalar is, a, is itself. And then if GZ has this kind of form, that means why? Yeah, let me ask you a question as a test. If GZ is a white matrix, What's the dimension of the output and what's the dimension of the input? Let's say this is a three by one matrix, transfer function matrix. Uh, one by three, one by three, one by three. What are the dimensions of the input and output? Why is, why should be a single output, so it's one? And uh, I should have three inputs. So if this happens, what, this is going one step further. If y equals cx plus v, now you see, if y is single output, then v has to be a scalar, right? So if that happens, Recall what was the definition of V. V is the covariance matrix of the noise. So if V is a scalar, is a scalar random variable, then you see this is going to be a scalar. So the result is going to be just to take out the determ determinant part is exactly showing here. I can take out the determinant terms to achieve this. I can pull out V and then divide by V here. This is given us, if I assign this as zero, this is give, so yeah, no reduction. Here, if I want to know how the closed loop poles look like, this is defining the closed loop poles, closed loop eigenvalues, see here. So 
the cost of eigenvalues, if I want to see how that looks like, I can simply, by doing, uh, by assigning this to be zero. Right? Now, what will happen if, let's see, what will happen if W divided by V, if this term is uh, approaching zero? So this is, we're, we're moving to symmetric root locus. What will happen for intuition? This is also a review. What will happen if I have K, G, in a closed loop system? What will happen if K is approximately zero? What are the closed loop poles for this system? That's the first question. Second, second question is, uh, if the system are stable, what will happen if k is approaching infinity? What will be the closed loop poles of this new of this closed loop system? This is the root locus analysis. It's a review. If k, let's do the first case. If k approaches zero. What are the close to poles? No, there are still poles. Open loop poles, right? If this is approximately zero, then it's essentially I don't have the feedback. I cut off the feedback close to that connection. Then it's the, the poles are the open loop poles. Then if K is going to infinity, then the poles are the open loop zeros. Okay? Exactly the same thing here. If this term is approaches zero, then the poles defined by this are the open loop poles of this transfer function here. And then here, if it approaches infinity, then the common filter poles are going to be the zeros, zeros of this matrix here. Okay. There's just one thing that you, you need to pay special attention to, is this. If, if the poles of GZ, are, all of them are stable, if, if poles of GZ are stable, what will be, how will the poles of GZ minus one be look like? Stable or unstable? And why? Yeah, it's, it's kind of easy to see. If GZ is a G, Z minus, let's say, 0.8, 1. Take a simple case, you can see. If GZ looks like this, then GZ minus 1 looks like 1 divided by Z negative 1, negative minus 0.8. The zeros, of the poles of this is going to be one divided by 0.8. So if the, if the poles of these are stable, then the poles of these are unstable. This is exactly why it's called symmetric root locus. Because uh, there's always one pair, another, another pole that is directly related to, there's always an unstable pole that's directly related to the stable pole. Okay? Now if you buy that, let's see the result here. Pay special attention to this. Okay? I said common filter poles has to go to the stable poles of this guy. And uh, in the case of in the case of the uh, W divided by V goes to infinity, it goes to the stable zeros of this. Why is that? Why I can say it will go to the stable poles and zeros? That's the thing that uh, you have to pay attention to. Yeah, so even if this guy has unstable poles, unstable zeros, but common, the common filter poles will not go to the unstable one. It has to be the stable poles of that. Why is that? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the reason. We have proof that the common filter is stable, right? So it will the it it will not be the unstable pose of this. That's uh, something very subtle. So look at here. These are the, the poles, right? This is given the common filter pole. This is given something different. It's the mirror of the common filter pole. So what I'm saying is the, the common filter pose from here is going to go to the stable ones, and the, the pose here is going to go to the unstable ones. That's the hidden message. Anyway, uh, that's something very subtle. Eigenvalue is one, okay? Mm -hmm. It marginally stable. That will count to. Mm, let, let's let's first see. So your your statement is that G Z has a marginally stable pole. Okay. Then you are asking uh, how the common filter pole is going to look like. So one thing, one thing to notice here is that these are the limiting cases. So it, it says it's going to approach the pole, regardless of whether I treat it as stable or unstable. It says it's going to approach this pole. It, it's, not, it's never one. It's approaching one. So it's still stable. So it's going to approach from somewhere Let's say if this is one, the common filter pole is gonna, it's gonna do this. It's gonna approach to this, but it's still inside the unit circle. Yeah, in that sense, in the in the limiting sense, and there will be some some pole that's going from this side. Yeah. Okay. But keep in mind, guys, the the main message is common filter is stable. And uh, we can have tools to analyze the stability and how the poles is going to look like. Now, I want to switch gears to the continuous time case. And uh, I won't, uh, unlike the discrete times common filter, I won't derive everything here. Uh, I will just uh, describe the central equations and the result here. Uh, so the continuous time case. The system is going to look like this. Again, W and V, they are white Gaussian noises. And uh, in this case, I'm assuming the initial stage. So the assumptions are the initial stage is random. And then W is random vector. V is random vector. OK? And again, we are trying to minimize XP with uh, its estimation given all the measurements from zero to t. And the equation for the continuous time common filter is gonna look quite similar to the continuous time observer dynamic. So it's gonna be the derivative of the estimate equals ax hat plus bu plus f times the error term, the error term. And then the common filter matrix, gain matrix, is gonna be given, it's again related to the statistic properties of the noise and the M, which M additionally depends on W. So the gain depends on the properties, statistic, stochastic properties of the noise. And if we have the observability and the controllability assumption, I am going to have the common filter is going to have a steady state common filter where the gain matrix are constant and the covariance matrix 
is going to be also convert to a constant value. So this is very, again, we can have the duality with the L cube problem. Well, we have uh, the algebraic Riccati equation here. And this looks very similar to the algebraic Riccati equation of the Kalman filter. Mm -hmm. Where? It means x hat t slash t means the estimation of x t given y tau well, the tau uh, is going from 0 to t. This is what it means. It's using all the information up to t to estimate x of t. Now, there's one thing that's really fantastic about common filter. It's, uh, think about what we have did, what we have done. We have derived the common filter equation. And then we have, we have discussed what the common filter is trying to do. It's trying to do optimal state estimation under noise case. We have not discussed how common filter, how well common filter is doing, okay? We have not discussed for instance, in this case, we have not discussed how this residual term is going to look like. We have not discussed whether this residual term is truly something we cannot do, we cannot minimize any further, right? I have not discussed this guy. If, if somehow I can show this error term it's just impossible for, for, for us to reduce further. Then that's saying the common filter is doing a great job. Everyone sees that? So this is what I want to do next. I want to show you that this residual term is just a common filter already give us the best thing we can achieve. This residual term is impossible to reduce it further. That's what I want to do next. Okay? I just need two statements, two observations to be, to be able to achieve this. First of all, for the common filter equation, again, I can, I can obtain how the common filter equation looks like in a block diagram, which is shown here, which is very similar to what we have seen in discrete time series. We again have x hat and uh, fs times this error term, y minus this guy, c times x hat. And then uh, the final b, more rigorous. Again, I will have to put b, u, t here. But uh, this is the closed-loop dynamic, closed-loop uh, block diagram for the common filter equation. Now, we have discussed the discrete time common filter problem has a return difference equality. So for the continuous time case, it also has a return difference equality where this, this term, again, you see, is the difference between if I inject a signal I here, if I inject a signal I here, and then the returning signal is going to be uh, C SI minus A inverse FS. So the difference between the signal I injected and the signal that's returned is the return difference, I plus C SI minus A inverse FS. So there's also return difference equality. Now, I can simply substitute S, every S, with J omega to achieve this equation here. Someone tell me, uh, what is the transfer function from y to ey? What's the transfer function from y to ey in this block diagram? So it's a multiple input, multiple output transfer function. So it's going to be.
just as a review. For single, e so a single input, single output case, what's the transfer function between y and dy? It's going to be 1 divided by 1 plus g, right? It's the, actually, it's called, if you, if you have taken any loop, uh, loop shaping class, it's called the sensitivity function. It's called the sensitivity function of the closed loop system. So for the multiple input, multiple output case, things are exactly the same. The transfer function from y to dy is going to be, now it's going to be some inverse term. Inverse of i plus the open loop transfer function, which is going to be uh, c s i minus a inverse f x. So the sensitivity function is defined by this guy here, which is, as you can see, it's the inverse of the return difference. That's again giving us the confirmation that the return difference is telling us the closed loop information. All right, now you have seen, this is what we have derived. The transfer function from y to ey is the inverse of the return difference here. If you see that, what is, if you see that, if I know the spectral density of y, what will be the spectral density of the ey signal here? What will be the spectral density of EY here? Okay, that's the question. This is talked about, I think, uh, one week ago, maybe. If the, if the input going to a system G is the output, then the spectral density of the output is going to be G, let me do the continuous time case, G J omega, G negative J omega times the spectral density of U, the single input, single output case, all right? So for this case, uh, this is just a, the matrix case, all right? This is a multiple input, multiple output matrix, and these are the inputs. You're going to see that the system dynamics is going to appear twice. So this guy is going to appear twice. And the result is this. So if you know the spectral density of Y, then the spectral density of EY can be very simply obtained by this result here. This is g y to e y j omega this is the g y to e y negative j omega and then it cancels all right negative yeah it should be negative yeah it's a typo uh-huh, according to the laws I announced earlier, homework two, come to me in my office hour. I will give you the hint for one of the homework problems. So yeah, it's, it's negative. It's a typo here. Now, If I have the system dynamics that looks like this, what will be what will be the spectral density? Because we have seen that I need this quantity. So what will be the spectral density of this given the system dynamics like this? <coughs> the result is gonna be I have a, it looks like this. W 
going into my system, which I have denoted the tensor function of t. Again, I have a typo here, but I found it out. Another typo. So if I, the picture is this. If I have W going into the system, then this is uh, how the picture that looks like. It's way here. This is Y. So W is the noise term. And then V is the other noise term. Okay. I haven't put this U, U term here because it's a statistic deterministic signal, so uh, it won't affect the stochastic properties of the system. All right, so here, now here, from here, you will be able to understand the, uh, this equation here. If I denote this as y1, now you see the spectral density of y1 is gonna be uh, g j omega, if this is g, you say if this is g, g j omega, then w, which is the uh, covariance matrix of W, G negative J omega transpose. And then Y, the spectral density of Y is just gonna be the spectral density of Y1 plus the spectral density of V, which is uh, give us the equation here. That's how the uh, spectral density of Y looks like. Now, look at this return difference equality. Look at this return difference equality. On the right-hand side, I have a uh, spectral density of y. And on the left hand side, I have these results here. And I have shown you I have shown you this. I've shown you that the spectral density of E y is this times this times this. Look at the equations very carefully. If I multiply the inverse of this matrix on the left-hand side, I'm gonna get, and then multiply the inverse matrix of this guy on the right-hand side, I'm gonna get exactly V equals I minus, I, I plus C J omega I minus A inverse F S inverse C Y Y then uh, here is I my I plus C I won't write it the full result but this is uh, this guy here right now look at these results look at this one and this one the right hand side are exactly the same so it gives us a conclusion that the spectral density of E y, the error signal, equals to V. That's uh, from these two observations. Okay. All right? The right-hand side equals exactly the right-hand side here. So it gives us this conclusion. What does this tell us? The error signal, the spectral density of the error signal is flat. Right? This is saying it's independent of omega is gonna be constant at any frequency. What does that mean? It's white, right? It says, it is says EY is white. Okay? So that's good result. That's saying uh, Kalman filter is doing a great job. Yes. Make it to zero over two. Uh, no, because <laughs> it's kind of, that's a good question. But uh, let me go to here. This is the noise term in the output. 
way here. Okay, that's just the noise over there. If I have a sensor that's give me the that's give me this error, I can I can do nothing about the sensor, right? So the common filter result is giving us the spectral density dy is v. It's giving us the best thing it can do. The sensor we cannot change the sensor noise, right? We we can it, it's given to us. So, yeah, think about it. It's the best we can do. Now, okay, I'm just going to finish up with uh, quickly with uh, state telling you that for the continuous time common filter, there's also a symmetric loop loader, which is by taking the determinant very similar to what we have done in the discrete time case, which is uh, taking the determinant of the return difference equality and uh, obtaining this result here. So for a single output case, it's again, we can analyze what will happen if we divided by W approaches zero and what will happen if it approaches infinity. The result is gonna be exactly the same. If we divide it by W goes to zero, then the common filter poles is gonna be the stable poles of uh, the transfer function here, okay? If it's uh, going to infinity, it's gonna be the stable zeros of this uh, transfer function. Uh, let's see, okay. I had wanted to do one example for the symmetric loop loaders. I don't have time, but uh, it's given, it's provided in the, in the course reader. So, uh, and it's very easy to read. You can take a look at how the root locus, simple case, will look like. Wrap it up. We have, we have done, we have finished the following topics. We have defined the big picture of common filter problem, which is uh, least square state estimation. And then we discussed the discrete time common filter continuous time common filter. Uh, over there, we have, this is deriving the common filter equation. And then here, it's basically showing common filter has good properties. So, that's the end of common filter uh, lectures. In the next lecture, I will discuss how common filter can be used in feedback control design. Okay. See you next time.